Hello and welcome to this video where today we were looking at Rutherford scattering. Um, basically Rutherford scattering provides evidence for the nuclear model of the atom that we know at this moment in time. So this, in this video we're going to look, have a look at um, the actual experiment and have a look at the findings of the experiment and then the conclusions that Rutherford drew from the experiment. So um, before we have a look at the, Rutherford's actual experimental setup, we'll have a look at what they thought the model of the atom looked like before they did this. So if you remember back from GCSE, um, prior to Rutherford doing this experiment, they thought an atom looked a little bit like this. So um, it was called the plum pudding model of the atom. And they knew about electrons. Now, J um, a guy called J.J. Thompson had discovered electrons, and they knew that the electrons were in atoms. And they also knew that electrons um, had a negative charge. What they also knew is that if you if you looked at a whole atom, then the actual charge of a whole atom was zero. So there must be something positive there in order to actually kind of cancel out the, the negative charges of these electrons. But they didn't know what it was. So they, they did what lots of scientists do, and they were just made stuff up. Um, to fit with the observations that they'd got. So they said that the electrons, which were very, very small particles, were kind of embedded in a positive charge. They didn't say what the positive charge was made of. They just kind of said, there's this positive charge here, and it's all spread out, and it's quite diffuse. So you had this positive charge, and the amount of positive charge is equal to the amount of negative charge, so overall you get a neutral atom. So Rutherford wanted to know what would happen if you took quite heavy particles and you fired them at these at these atoms. Now because this is fairly diffuse, the alpha particles should come along and he, he actually thought that the, what they'd do is they'd come along and they'd almost like burst these like a watermelon uh, because the alpha particles are really heavy so they kind of almost like pop these things um, and then the alpha particles would just continue their journey through. And, and he basically wanted to see what happened um, to if you actually did this to atoms. So he and his students came up with this equipment. They've got an alpha source, so basically just a radioactive source um, that gave off alpha radiation. So you've got an alpha source, and they knew that alpha particles were positive. And they placed that inside an evacuated chamber. Um, in other words, there's no air. And the reason they did this is because they wanted, um, they didn't want the alpha particles to be interfered with or to interact with um, any nuclei apart from the nuclei that they placed in there. Um, so basically, this means that there's no interactions with nuclei in the air, um, which would skew their results. So there's no interactions from the air. The atoms that they placed in there was in the form of really thin gold foil. The reason that they use gold is because it's a ductile material. Um, in other words, you can, you can hammer it into a really thin shape. And they chose, um, and they wanted to put it into a really, really thin shape because if you didn't, then there's a chance that your alpha particles would basically hit lots of atoms on their way through. So if you imagine if you zoomed right into your kind of your gold like this, um, if your alpha particle came along here, for example, there's a very good chance it would interact with this atom and, and this one and also this one. And we, we did, he didn't want that. He wanted to see what happened if it just if it just interacted with just one atom. So by making the gold foil thin, he, he attempted to reduce the number of layers of gold atoms and so therefore reduce the chance that the alpha particles would interact with, with lots of different atoms or lots of different gold atoms. So he did this, and actually they were really, really surprised at what they found, because what they saw was that the positive alpha particles came along, and most of them, as expected, just went straight through. Um, so what they did is they basically took this detector, and they had a look to see where the alpha particles went. And they saw where the alpha particles went, because when the alpha particles hit this fluorescent screen, they basically made a very small kind of flash of light. So they sat in a really dark room with a very small, kind of, with, a, with a microscope looking for these flashes of light. And they looked and they moved the detector around all the way around. Um, and they had a look to see how many particles came through at different angles. And like I say, most of the particles they saw went straight through, which is exactly what they expected. And they weren't really surprised by that. What they did see and what did surprise them is that few, very few of them, so a few of them, were deflected by greater angles. So some of them, for example, would come up here. Um, and by greater ang large angles, we're talking sort of like greater than about four degrees. What really surprised them, that what was the kind of result that kind of really, really shocked them almost, was that some of the alpha particles would come along 
and they would actually almost like bounce back on themselves. Some of them came back almost 180 degrees. You can't measure 180 degrees because that's where your alpha source is, but they came back at really, really, well, almost back, back on themselves. So that meant that these alpha particles were actually being repelled. They must be repelled because if they were attracted by whatever it was in, it was in here, they, that means they can't kind of bounce away. Um, so this really shocked them. And they had to really sit down and really think quite really hard about that, what that meant in terms of what an atom looked like. So these are the three findings. We need to know how they got from here and these three, just three observations from their results to our model of an atom that looks like this. So how, and how, why it means that this can't happen anymore. So the first conclusion, most of the particles pass straight through. Well, what that really means is that because the alpha particles didn't actually interact with, with anything, then it must mean that then they're not doing anything. Most of it's empty space. Well, it doesn't really change this model at this moment in time because they thought that things would go straight through. Um, but when you couple it with the next two findings, then you'll see that this can't possibly happen. So we'll come back to that in one second. They saw that a few were deflected like, sorry, a few were deflected by large angles. So whatever was doing this deflecting um, was really, really small. If it was bigger, then more would be deflected by large angles. Now, this can't possibly be true because this positive charge is really diffuse and so really wouldn't actually repel the alpha particles away. So this positive thing that's doing the repelling must be some very small and concentrated. So if it's small and concentrated, then if the alpha particles are not interacting with it, it must mean that they're quite a long way away from it, which is why we, if we then go back to this one, why lots of our atom must be empty space. So we've now got that we've got this thing here, it, it, which is very small compared to the size of an atom, and around it is some empty space. And the fact that they're repelled, as I've kind of I've already alluded to, um, and not attracted, means that this thing must be positive, because as the alpha particles, which themselves are positive, that came in, some of them, if they were almost going head on towards this thing, were repelled at really, really big angles. So that changed this view to this view. Now there's one kind of extra little step um, because Rutherford knew that if you put, if the electrons were kind of mixed in with this very dense positive bit, then overall it would make this thing neutral. Um, and so when the alpha particles come in, they wouldn't again be deflected by really big angles. And so the electrons can't be very close or be associated with the positive charge. So the positive and the negative charges are a long way away from each other in terms of atomic spacing. And so therefore what he came up with was the idea that you've got this this central positive charge where most of the mass is because the electrons are so light and the electrons are kind of around it. Um, and that was his that was his initial idea. Um, and so basically he went from this model over here and he rapidly, just by doing this one experiment, changed the model of the atom to this, which is kind of the familiar atom that we know now. So there's a couple of other ways that you can kind of have a look for um, evidence for the nucleus. And these are the two, from, from an A-level point of view, these, are, these two are the two that are most important. And in our next video, we'll have a look at these two in more detail when we come to have a look at how we can actually measure the size of the nucleus. So we've seen that, um, but when we're looking for evidence that or we're looking basically to see what things are made up of what's really important is that we consider the energy and we also want to consider the type of particle that we've got so those two things um, if you've got a really high energy that you're then the particle that you're using will basically come in and because it's got such high energy it'll smash apart whatever the thing is that you're looking for which is really what you not what you want and if you look at the wrong if you use the, use the wrong type of particle uh, then potentially other forces can get in the way so for example um, alpha particles in terms of energy are pretty good because the energy is fair in in some respects is fairly small however when if they get close to the nucleus they interact via the strong interaction and the strong interaction is going to change the kind of results that you get Electron scattering is done through, as we'll see, through electron diffraction. They need higher, much higher energies of about 6 GeV, so much higher. So there's a chance that they could come in and basically start to smash your nuclei apart. The advantage, obviously, is that they, they're leptons, so they don't interact via the strong interaction. Two other ways that you can kind of not necessarily look at the nucleus, especially with X-ray scattering, um, but you can determine 
your arrangement of atoms. So um, if you basically shoot X-rays into into an array of atoms, then you can actually look to see the arrangement of atoms, but not the nucleus. And the reason for that is is because the X-rays interact really strongly with the electrons, so they interact with the outside of the atoms and not the centre of it. Um, and one thing that's used is now used a lot for looking. At at kind of the arrangement of atoms and also inside atoms is neutron scattering. This is really useful and is often used and was used, for example, um, for the discovery of the structure of DNA. It's really useful because these things aren't charged, unlike alpha particles. Alpha particles are positive, and so you get that repulsion. Neutrons aren't, so they can get much closer to your nucleus without being repelled. They also interact with the nucleus, which is a good thing because then once they've interacted, they'll go off and you can see where they went to. Um, the problem with neutron scattering is that they're really difficult to accelerate. Um, alpha particles and the electrons are easy to accelerate. They're both charged, so you can just pop them into an electric or a magnetic field and basically accelerate them in that way. Neutrons are neutral. They have no charge, and so they, won't be, they can't be accelerated in a magnetic or electric field. So basically, if you want higher energy neutrons, you have to go to somewhere like a nuclear reactor to get that to work. So um, that's our evidence for the nucleus. We've looked at Rutherford scattering and the, the setup of his, of his experiment, just like you saw at GCSE. Um, we've had a look at his observations, and then we had a look at how those observations led to conclusions, which meant that the model of our atom went from the plum pudding model to the nuclear atom as we know it now. In our next video, we'll look at um, the size of the nucleus, and we'll look at alpha particle scattering and electron scattering in much more detail. But for now, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.